Over to you, mate. Jesus then left that place and went into the region of Judea, across the Jordan. Again crowds of people came to him, and as was his custom, he taught them. Some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What did Moses command you? He replied. They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law. Jesus replied, But at the beginning of creation God made them male and female. For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will be become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one. Therefore what God has joined together, let, no man, let man not separate. When they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. He answered, Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. Thank you. Okay, I'll scrub your pens. <coughs> oh, I tell you what, I hope you're ready to think today. I really do hope you're ready to think. Let's pray together. Lord, we need your help to grapple with your word and to see who we are and how we should respond. We thank you that the Lord Jesus came as the restoring, renewing, releasing king. We thank you that everywhere he went, he exposed the foolishness of men and women on the run from you. He pointed to a better hope and he carried people to that better hope. And we thank you for that. So we pray today that as we think on what we've got here in this passage, you would help us to see through the Lord Jesus' eyes and to find hope in all that he brings. Lord, come, help us to listen, help us to process, help us to have a heart of compassion, help us, Lord, to have a, a heart of faith. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Brilliant. So, we're going to end up in a strange place today because as you look at this passage, you think it's all about divorce and marriage. Can I tell you, it's about so much more than that. I don't know whether you've ever felt trapped in something, and I think so many of us do. Uh, sometimes we feel trapped in our circumstances. Sometimes we feel trapped by other people's actions. Sometimes we might feel trapped with something we don't know how to overcome. But I, here's the problem. The real things that trap us... We're not even aware we're ensnared and trapped by them. Quite often we merely feel confused and desperate to try and find a sensible way out. Usually ambitious for just easing our pain or making life the way we want it. But in that moment when we're confused and full of ambition, we are actually trapped. Because we were never originally designed to struggle through life. We were designed originally to reign in life, but our running away from the Lord has caused all kinds of brokenness in all kinds of ways. And you say, Steve, that all sounds very lofty, but what are you talking about? Well, I'm talking about Poppy. I'm talking about my six-year-old daughter. Poppy, all at the moment, she's trying to figure out who she is. And there's so many competing voices. So if you ask Poppy, who is she? She'll just blandly look at you and go, I'm Poppy. And she'll go, well, who am I? And what she doesn't know in that moment is as you ask that question, you are asking the question that will help her figure out how to move out into life and what to do and how to face everything. Because our sense of identity or our confusion over our identity or our ambitions for our identity control almost everything. So, Poppy, who are you? Well, I'm a Casey. Well, what does that mean? I'm a little girl. Well, what does that mean? Uh, I live in this place and I belong to this family. Well, what does that mean? And she's, as a human being, as your kids, well, forget your kids, as you did and still do, she's trying to make the sense of the ultimate question, who the monkeys am I and what does that mean for me? And we're right in the middle of a, a world that is trapped in confusion and sometimes vain ambition as they try to answer that question. Now, I want you to see that that is exactly where... 
The world that Jesus spoke into was that. It just presented in a different way. In fact, you can see it there down at chapter 10, verse 1. Let's have a little look. Chapter 10, verse 1 and verse uh, 2. Jesus then left that place and went into the region of Judea and across the Jordan. And straight in there, there is a story to tell of Judea and Jordan and what it meant to be a person in, in that place and, and what you were pursuing and what you were living for and what you were going after. In the same way, there's a big story behind or your personal stories, or the stories of people in Speak, or the stories of the people in the UK, or the people who write the news, or write the movies, or the... We've all got a big story behind us. But in the middle, look, there are some people there, and Jesus was teaching them. He was reorienting their story in the way they saw themselves. He wasn't teaching 2 plus 2 equals 4. Those are facts. What he was doing was giving them a lens as to how to look at themselves and life. And into that come some characters. They're the guys with, well, the shady looking hats because they're the bad guys. Some Pharisees came and what's in their mind? They want to discredit him. Can you see the word there? What's the word that's used? Test him. And let's, this isn't friendly. You know, sometimes we can have a free exchange of ideas to try to get to the truth. When it says there they came to test him, they were out to discredit him. I mean, I'm so glad I'm not in the media these days. You know how crushing that would be, is that somebody, you know, you're, you're asked some sort of political opinion and they listen and they just want to get, you speak for five minutes, they want to get a, a ten second sound bite that they can use. And is it to build you up? No, it's to discredit you and knock you down. But what they don't realise at the moment is that they're the ones who are trapped. They're the ones who are held. They're the ones who are stuck in confusion, controlled by their ambitions. They're the ones who are trying to make sense of this thing called life. And they don't realise that right in the midst of them is this towering figure who will both expose their wrong understandings about who they are and what they want from life and how they tick. And will come along and comfort those who are hurting. But also he's the one who will come along and save anybody who will ask that of him. You see, Poppy needs Jesus, not just her mum and dad, to make, help her make sense of who she is. You see, she has her mum and dad and a school and a church and the place where she lives and the clothes that she wears and the activities that she do, does. All in some way help her make sense of who she is. But it'll all be wonky if it's not lined up with who God has made her to see herself. She'll be left in confusion and she'll have vain ambition and be pursuing all kinds of answers. Because that question of who am I is just so incredibly powerful. So here's Jesus and he's this towering presence. And he's the only one who's not confused and he's the only one who's not got a vain and empty ambition. He's the pure one right in the midst. Let's remember who we've seen him to be up to this point in Mark's Gospel, because we need to figure out why he's talking about this right here. He has come not just to save, but he has come to reclaim what is his. He has come to re-establish a kingdom of people who want to be put back together by the God who made and loved them. And that immediately tells us how he sees you and me. Oh, we're not as bad as we could be, but we are broken and distorted at every level of our humanity. You walk out in the Lord of life... Everything breaks. And you guys have sat under me preaching this to you long enough to know that we really do believe that this event called the fall, where humanity turned away from the Lord, broke and distorted everything. And from that point on, rather than find our identity, who we are and our direction in life by the God who made and loved us, what we will do is we will try and find our identity and direction in life from everything that is around us. So even the good gifts that God gives us, we will hijack, we will shanghai to try and make an identity out of for ourselves. So we will take good things like our gender or marriage or our achievements or the places we go and we will try to make an identity for us and use those as a source of strength to go out into the world and face and do whatever we want to do. And if it's not centred on who God is, everything will sooner or later go wrong. And Jesus has come back to establish his rule, and he's established his credentials. He is the one who can calm the chaos, crush the evil, break the oppression, give life to the dead, heal the outcast. He is the conquering king, and they get that. But what they don't get 
is the way that he will do it. You see, he is the conquering king, the one who goes the way of the cross. He will suffer the worst that the world throws at him in order to buy for us a better future. Now, there are only two identities in the world at the end of the day. Identity number one is you crack out on your own and you define yourself any which way you want to and then reap the whirlwind as a result. Or you come under this new conquering king, Jesus. You come under him and let him define you and let him show you what your life will be about. And what he said at the start of this main section was very simple. Anyone who must come after, who will come after me, be one of his people, must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me too. He doesn't say that's how you become one of his people. No, no, that you become his people purely because he's gracious and merciful. In fact, at the end of this chapter, we've this, got this blind dude, Bartimaeus, and he, he, he gets what, the only way you get in with Jesus. He just cries out to the Lord, son of David, have mercy on me and all the upright uh, people who think they can get in on their own. Shut up, shut up, shut up. But this guy who's stuffed, he knows he needs that mercy. He cries, son of David, have mercy on me. No, the only way you get in is by receiving a gift. As we're going to find out in the next section of Mark's Gospel, in 17 through to 31, a place in his kingdom is not achieved, it is merely received. Oh, that would be a great place for an amen, but okay, let's not worry about that. We'll move on. But that's not to say that those who follow after Jesus, they will become like him in that they will give their lives away to bless and help others in this recovery and reclamation process that Jesus is on. The disciples haven't got there yet. They're still thinking power. They're still thinking prestige. They're still thinking, make an identity for me apart from who Jesus is. And so we come to this strange place where you've got, it seems to be a discussion about marriage and divorce, but something else is going on here. Okay. So verse 1 and 2 again, we see that they're out to discredit him. Now, whenever you get, uh, okay, why is it difficult to talk about marriage and divorce? It's difficult to talk about marriage and divorce because it is difficult to go through marriage and divorce. Can I get an amen? Okay. And the reason that marriage is difficult is because you're throwing two self-absorbed sinners who struggle and confused about who they are and have got their own ambitions into a tight space and say, love one another rather than live your own agenda and define yourself by what you want to be. And you're in this tight space, and that's going to create fireworks. And then divorce is difficult, because divorce is a rending of something that has been put together, a separation. And it's hard to talk about divorce, because it's hard to go through divorce. Whenever something goes wrong, we always ask two questions, don't we? Question number one, who's to blame? Question number two, how do we put it right? And we're going to come to those two questions just a little bit later on, and, and we won't actually answer that for about marriage and divorce until next week, by the way. But let's keep moving on and see what's going on here. They're trying to discredit Jesus. They're trying to trap him, but they are actually the ones who are trapped, and you get to see it by what they actually ask. Verse 2, some of the Pharisees came and tested him by asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Now, have you seen how balmy and out of kilter and unjust that is? Do you see what they're really asking? Do you get under that? Okay, it's not equal. He's saying, I've really decided I want to distance myself from the missus. Can I get away with it? Do you see how trapped that question is? Do you see how loaded up with self-interest? Do you see how far it is from the identity and the intention that God has given to his... They don't even see it. They don't even get it. He's saying, is it lawful for me to use marriage and relationships in the way that suits my interest? Do I get to write my own story, write my own ticket? Can I get away with that, please? Is it lawful? Is that who I am? Do you see what they're asking? And I love the way Jesus deals with this. Because straight away he goes, what did Moses command you? Now remember, these are first century Jewish people and Moses wrote the Old Testament law that talks about how the people of Israel were to relate to each other. And there are loads of instances and loads of places where it gets spoke about. And the bit that immediately they come back with and they don't answer correctly, by the way. 
They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. Actually, what it says is, if a man is to marry somebody and then divorces them, so Moses didn't say it's okay to divorce somebody. He said, it's a reality that happens. And when that reality happens, we need to put in certain protections to make sure people are properly looked after. But I'm not saying that it was ever supposed to be that way in the first place. Do you see, the, do you see where they're trapped? They're trapped in a mindset of, what does it mean for me to be human? Who am I? How do I use my relationships in a way that suits me? What are my ambitions and desires? What can I get away with? Now, you and I are so used to seeing that mindset everywhere that it's almost, it just bounces off. He's going, yeah, yeah, that's it. That was never the way it was supposed to be. We were made with purpose and intention to image the glory and the greatness of God. And we've traded that all away for, how can I make my little life work the way I want it to work? And get away with it. Trapped. Now, of course, you feel the tug of that, don't you? Because you want the people in your life to be exactly the way you want them. Because in your mindset, that's, that's liberation, that's life. Of course, I've moved beyond such things. I spend myself for the glory of God and the love of my wife. I'm not going to show you the, the look on Jane's face right now. But I'm just as trapped. I'm just as trapped. So where does Jesus go with this? Wow, verse 5. It was because your, it's, it's an interesting, your, he's not talking there. What did Moses say to them? He said, no, because your. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law. He's saying something about how screwed up, messed up we are because of our marching out on the Lord, uh, on the Lord and his intention for our life. He said the place where everything is going wrong is in the human heart. Where did all the trouble start? Hard-heartedness, not necessarily towards a spouse, but towards God to start off with. Towards him. We have a bent out of shape way of seeing ourselves and relating to other people. God's intention for who you are, how you live, what you're supposed to do, what it's all about. If you mess that up, it's because of your hard-heartedness. It's a little bit like the idea, I mean, remember all of those things, they're, re they're really quite powerful, aren't they? Who am I and how do I relate to people? They're incredibly painful. In fact, they're the only thing that people ever sing about in the, mu in the charts these days. This is who I am and this is how I love people. Um, it's incredibly powerful. It totally reshapes us. It's a little bit like God gives you a gun. Now, he hasn't given you a gun, but he gives you a big gun and he says, that's the danger of ascent. Don't point it at yourself. It might go off, and if it does, it'll blow your head off. But you, because of your hard-heartedness that says, well, I'm going to be in charge of me, because of your hard-heartedness say, look what I can do with the gun. You spin it around on your finger, and guess what? The barrel starts pointing at your face, and it accidentally goes off, and what happens to your face? It decorates the wall behind you. Or was that because there was a problem with the gun? That's because there's a problem with the hard heart. And Jesus says, this is why you need a king who comes to rescue you from yourself. This is why you need a king who knows how serious your sin and rebellion is, that he is prepared to become the lowest of the low, though he's the highest of the high, and go to a cross and pay for your sin and break the power of your sin. Your humanity is crushed and broken, it is because of your hard hearts that we have to make allowances and give concessions. Otherwise, you consume each other even more. So we're all messed up by the fall and our rejection of the Lord. We've all got distorted views of ourselves, of relationships, of marriages, the way we think, the way we feel. We are distorted, distorted and bent out of shape and trapped in it. And even in the midst of that, we think ourselves wise. 
And so Jesus is now going to go back to three rock-solid precepts or principles to answer this question in relation to, to marriage and divorce, which we're going to look at next week and zone in on marriage and divorce. But we can't move past the first of the three precepts. We need to spend 15 or 20 minutes looking at this one because as a church, I don't think we've addressed it yet. Somebody read nice and loudly for me verse 6. Stop there. Okay. What is the world coming to that I have to preach for 20 minutes on that? But I'm going to. Because it's not a given anymore, is it? It would have been in the first century. It would have been in almost every culture down through the history. And what God has connected together, do not separate. Those are all things from the beginning. And that's the place where Jesus goes. He says, here you go, bang, bang, bang. If you're, you're going to need somebody to untrap you and bring you back to this, is what he says. And of course, he's the man for the job. So we'll look at those bottom two next week. We'll talk about marriage. We'll talk about being between one man and one woman. We'll talk about what's gone wrong to get us in a place where that's not even assumed in our culture anymore. Then we'll look at, well, what do you do about divorce and how, how do you think about, what, about separating a sort of amputation of one flesh? What, how do we think about that? And as I've already said, talking about marriage and talking about Divorce is not easy to talk about. It feels painful because going through both those things feels painful in one way or another. But I want to look particularly at verse 6 and this whole issue of gender identity. Okay? I told you you're going to have to think. I told you you're going to have to think. So, verse 6. Dean, you read it really well. Could you read it again for me, please? Simple as that. Now, I need to say this. Some of you, as I, as I start to talk about this, are going to think, Steve, some of the things that you're talking about here sound absolutely absurd. And some of you will be tempted to just almost snigger about it. I'm not going to do that, and I won't allow you to either. Because gender identity struggles are so difficult for people who are facing them. Statistically, somewhere between 1.5% and 2% of people have um, clinically severe gender identity struggles, which basically means this. I'm really confused about what it means for me to connect with my biology. When my biology says I'm either male or female, I, I feel very disconnected from that, and it causes me distress, and it causes me trauma. So although on one level we might simply just want to say, well, it's there in black and white, isn't it? Male, female, bang. I think the Lord Jesus would have us be so much more gracious and compassionate about that. I think if our church is to be anything, our church should be a safe place for people who have any kind of identity struggle, agreed? Which is all of us. All of us are trying to figure out who we are. All of us try and find ways to bolster that sense of... I mean, anybody here wearing something with a label... You attach yourself, Jason's at the back and he's attaching himself to labels. He's got, he's not, maybe not got gender identity issues, but he's got identity issues. Because that's what labels are all about. Why on earth do fat, middle-aged, overpaid men want to go out and buy big, fancy cars? Because they want to feel worth something and they want to attach themselves to something that says they're somebody. Everything's about <laughs> identity issues. So if somebody struggles with uh, either their sexual identity or their gender identity, I want them to come in here and I want them to know that we're all in recovery. Is that something we're okay with? Now that's really important about the shape of us. We're not going to deny the gospel because the gospel says we all need recovery, we all need mercy, we all need hope, we all need change and we're all bent out of shape and confused and got funny ambitions. All of us. So having said that, uh, let's talk a little bit about the, the, the issues that have developed in culture recently. Okay, so, hold on, I've got lots of little bits of quotes and stuff, and um, I'm sure we're going to get a chance for you guys to come back on me at one point or another. Here it is, okay? So in a recent article, 
uh, in the New Yorker in the States, uh, the report gives an overall impression that just like femininity, masculinity is increasingly defined by both playing to and against type. It's growing a really impressive beard and ordering kale salad for lunch. That sounds confused to me, Kosh. Okay. It's knowing Super Bowl trivia and being an emotionally supportive partner. Can you imagine somebody who can tell you all the stats on Liverpool Football Club and be an emotionally supportive partner? Let's ask Rach about Matty. Okay. So there's real confusion over what it means to be male. There's real confusion as well, I think, and well, this person will exemplify it, over being known as a woman, or being a lady, or being a girl. So Natasha Devon, who is the government's former mental health czar, has stated that teachers should not refer to pupils as girls or ladies. Now, she's probably thought this through a bit, and she's, she's probably trying to guard against something. So I want to hear what she wants to guard against. Why would it be that she would not be ashamed or cautious about speaking to pupils about what they are? And this is what it says. It's a constant reminder of their gender. She has also stated that she would never walk into a room in an all-girls school and say girls or ladies because it was patronising. Now, can I tell you, when I worked in a girls' school, it wasn't patronising at all. There was a real sense of pride. But she seems to see something different. Boys or girls should not be used as a form of address by teachers, she stressed. Rather, teachers should use gender-neutral terms such as pupils, students or pe people. She also stated that addressing girls as girls can make girls feel they must be perfect, which can create a lot of anxiety in children and teenagers. Now, I've got no idea whether she's right or wrong or not. The thing I'm simply observing here is that we're not quite sure how to deal with this issue of gender of being male or female. And one of the ways in which that is, is just getting pushed, um, pushed further and further, hold on a second, where's my next quote? I'll find my next bit of paper. What have I done with it? Aha. Hold on one second. There it is. Some people are even wanting to bin off gender altogether. So some of you will have bought onto Amazon Prime. Um, Jill Soloway is the director of Amazon's award-winning online TV program called Transparent. Has anybody seen it, Transparent at all? No, you might have heard of it, seen it advertised. It and she claims this. Sorry, it's about um, an older father coming out um, as, a, uh, as a transsexual to his adult children. And th this director claims, in a few years, we're going to look back and say, when we were little, we used to think that all women had vaginas and all men had penises. But now, of course, we know that's not true. You may wonder how a biological fact can, can stop being true. Well, anyway, uh, the, the, the review that I'm reading here is basically pushing to say that we will no longer construct the terms male and female in the tra traditional way anymore. That's where she's pushing and that's where, what she would like to see. So on the one hand, you've got this confusion over what it means to be one gender or another. And then on another hand, what you've got is this reality that there are... One and a half to two percent of people struggle with feeling like they are trapped in the wrong body. That there is some sort of disconnection from, of the inner person with the outer person. And if I'm to live a satisfied life, I'm so distressed by this, I need to find some sort of respite and some sort of answer. And the best way for me to do that is to, to live not in the expression of the physical body, but the, the inner person. So therefore, what I might do is at certain points, I might want you to refer to me with the pronouns of how I feel on the inside. So use, if I'm a fella who feels like a woman, would you please use she when you talk about me? Uh, I might want to change my clothes so that um, I, I, I dress like what I feel I am on the inside. I might even want to explore the possibility of having my body physically cut and altered in order for it to match the feelings that I have on the inside. And until I 
feel uh, until I experience that, I don't think I can live a full and authentic life. And of course, as you know, one of the big pursuits for people at the moment is have a full and authentic life. I don't think I can be satisfied. I don't think I can be emotionally whole. I, I can't see a way through. I, I, I suffer with depression and sadness and this thing hangs over me. Now, can I tell you, if, if you're in a situation like that where you're, you're, you're struggling with gender confusion, that's a really crushing and horrible place. The occasion of suicidality amongst um, people who express these kind of struggles and identity issues is something like 20 times greater than those who don't. And in some sense, you can understand why. When I, when, when I live with this tension inside myself every day, I, just, I don't know how to, I don't know quite how to face the future. So there's this phenomenon that is being driven that in some sense, the, in fact, I've got a little, just a little quote for you in terms of the, the, the the psycho- psychologist and psychiatrist Bible, which is called the DSM, they describe gender dysmorphia like this. A marked incongruence between one's experienced, expressed gender and assigned gender. And you say, well, what's an assigned gender? Depending on who you speak to, it, it means different things. But basically, what are you recognized as biologically and scientifically when you're born? There is a tiny, 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 tiny proportion of people who ex, who, whose biology they contain some different, um, both female and male characteristics. They're called intersex, but they're very, 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 very rare. We're talking about people who have got a clearly assigned um, physical biology in one gender or another, but have got this confusion and this distress and this sense of incongruence between the others. Now, where am I up to in my notes? Okay. So there is a gender revolution happening fueled by people's stories and expressions of how they feel. Now part of the problem here is that you can't diagnose it. People just tell you they feel distressed. So they go to a doctor and they say, I'm really struggling with this. I think I'm, I know I've got a female body, but I think I'm a man. And the doctor says, okay. But the doctor has no way of diagnosing what's going on because all they can go off is the explained and spoken about feelings which for the person experiencing them are very real and very life dominating and crushing so these feelings are there so the big question and if you like almost battle in our society at the moment is how does a compassionate society family church help somebody who struggles with these kind of feelings I take it that we do want to help people. In fact, well, there's, there's two basic approaches, and the two approaches are at war. There's no other way to describe it. They're at war. Approach number one is this. Validate those feelings and change your definitions and your biology to fit. So due to compassion, maybe because there's some heart-wrenching story about somebody struggling with this, and you, you say, oh, well, I just want to accommodate that person. I want culture to say, oh, it's okay to feel like that. It's okay to be, to be there, and um, it's okay. We'll, we'll change our definition. So even though biologically you are a man, if you want us to just ease your pain just a little bit, and who wouldn't want to ease their pain? Ease that, that pain... We, we, we'll, 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 call you, we'll call you she if that, that eases. And we'll say that's equally helpful. What we'll do is we will we'll validate your experience in some way and change our def- definitions. And because we live in a world where people, because we've lost our definition and our identification with who God is, we want to define ourselves by something. And one of the places we go to define ourselves is how we feel and what we want for our life. And so there's a really heavy and strong expectation for us to do that. And in fact, I don't know whether you've ever noticed the kickback if you don't immediately validate people's thoughts and desires. Have you noticed that? Our culture says be who you are, do what you want. We have absolute autonomy, at least we're told. And our culture's new vision is human dignity unrestrained by external wisdom. 
So anyone who denies somebody their ultimate right to choose reality is labelled a bigot and hateful. I mean, on a lower level, you've experienced this when you've seen one of your friends, haven't you? Um, they've got some crackpot idea about how they want to spend their money or a job they want to do or the relationship they want to start and you can see that they're utterly set their heart on it and you think that they're nuts and you can see that it's not going to end well. But you feel the pain, don't you? It used to be that you just go up to them and start to say, you know, that's a bit daft, don't you? But nowadays, if you were to go up to somebody and say that, you'd immediately be, oh, but you don't love me. How could you say that? If you loved me, you'd agree with everything that I want. And so we're in a cultural moment here where camp number one that says give people what they want is the most loving thing to do is in ascendancy. Now, of course, that has caused an awful lot of problems because we don't do that across the board. So, for example, if you've got a teenage girl who's only eight stone and she's utterly convinced she's fat which at eight stone she's not she struggles with anorexia she believes she's grossly overweight the doctors won't ex accept her feelings will they they won't accept her feelings they will try to help her keep eating because they want her to live they don't doubt her feelings but they believe that her self perception is wrong do you see that? Or else somebody, and it used to be dealt with slightly differently, but if somebody thought they were hearing voices from the radio speaking to them personally, and everybody else around checked out and said, no, that's just the radio, go normal. A medical carer, a clinician, wouldn't take those feelings not seriously, take them very seriously, but you wouldn't agree with them, you would find another way to help care for them, to bring them out of what they're facing. Or people with body integrity identity disorder, BIID, who believe that their physical form doesn't match how they feel they should look, so they want one of their healthy limbs to be amputated. Doctors don't cooperate with those feelings, do they? In fact, it would be a cruel thing if they did by hacking off an undesired body part. Instead, they recognize an underlying physical condition that must be treated. But it's only in the case of transgenderism and struggles with gender identity where physical solutions are being offered for psychological and identity struggles. And so there's massive weight and a massive push being put upon resources and within the media to say this is the loving way to help people who feel this way and it's driven by ideology it's driven by certain ambitions and it's driven in part by desperation in the midst of the confusion so recently there was a uh, the, the the american sorry the president of the american college of pediatricians who looks after kids has made it her mission to highlight the harmful effects of gender transitioning on children for example now, at the time of her comments, um, she had written quite strongly um, scientific conclusions in her, uh, from experience it, in her job as the president of the American College of Pediatricians. And she's recently been um, quite, not violently, but aggressively protested by mobs of LGBTQ activists when she has uh, when she's simply come out and said, all teenagers and all ch children go through uh, a phase of identity confusion. If you start giving them medication, oh, it's found out that 80% of kids settle back down, those who are confused and, and are very happy with their biological gender. If you keep on pushing, you are going to be doing abuse to children. And she was very aggressively chased after and chased down for just putting that view across. So that's why I say it's sort of at war. So you've got this one side that says, okay, what do we do? Hold on, where's my bit of paper? This one side that says, validate feelings and change uh, the whole of culture. And then you've got the other side which says, hold on, there's got to be a way that we help with a psychological condition rather than doing violence to people or changing definitions that are clearly scientific, scientifically upheld. 
Now, as these two sides come to war, we're caught in the middle, and so are you and your families. So there's currently in Speak in the primary schools, they'll be asking questions about how to help people who struggle with gender identity. There will probably be storybooks being disseminated talking about uh, how a, a person can be confused about who they are. They start off as a, as a boy and end up as a woman. So there's actively being books put out there to say, this is normal, this is okay, let's get behind people. And in one sense, I want to applaud the initiative that says, let's care for people who've got identity struggles. But on the other hand, I think we have to go back to the words of Jesus. And that's back to verse 6. In the beginning, I, before the fall, before we walked out on the Lord, it was quite simple and straightforward. God created male and female. There are two genders, not 72 as according to Facebook. There are two genders, but there is a reality of an identity struggle. And we aren't surprised by that in the slightest. Because our Bible tells us of a humanity that is distorted and bent out of shape for all kinds of reasons. At the fall, our bodies are corrupted, our minds are corrupted, our worship is corrupted, we are deceived and deceiving, we misunderstand, we have all kinds of wonky ambitions, our personhood is confused, and it is painful. And it manifests in different ways, doesn't it? Some of us are born with or develop physical maladies. Some of you have had that and have experienced that, haven't you? You're either born with it or it develops... And it sort of sets you apart and makes you feel different. And those physical struggles or illnesses that come at you, um, they have spiritual temptations with, with them as well, don't they? Like to fear or to almost make an identity out of that physical struggle. And in some ways God can feel distant. So there's partly human choice in there. So if you like, there's, there's birth, there's adapting to the world, and there's us and our active heart in the middle. Some of us are born with or may have developed um, physiological or psychological maladies as well that set us apart from other people. There are such a thing as personality disorders or behavioural problems and within each of those there are particular temptations to self-absorption, to sin, to rebel against God, to not find his comfort and to try and find our own answers in those problems. All of us feel brokenness in our hearts. Those kind of maladies. We all come with stripes of hurt and we've all had to face down temptations. All of us use twisted desires and have our bent out of shape longings and our confusions and we run to all kinds of the wrong comforts. We rebel against God in the midst of that. We get sinned against. So there is nature, there is nurture and there is our own heart in the mix as well. And who's to say where the balance is in any one moment of blame? All we know is that those three things are in play. So it means that we move towards people with compassion. We listen to their story. They, we take their pain seriously because we care about them. But we go to Jesus to fix what is broken. He is the God who knew all this brokenness and it was that that motivated to leave the comfort and the glory of heaven. And he came down to be amongst us in our confusion and our, our ambition. And he came to be tested by those puny little men who were blind but thought they saw. And he came to them and with great patience he said, I'm here to restore and renew. And in case you doubt my love for you, I myself will become a victim of injustice, of brokenness and corruption. I will go to a cross so that no matter what your struggle right now, you can know that there is no condemnation written over you. For I have taken that condemnation. I will bring real newness and I will empower a war against brokenness. And I will be with you till a day when all that is broken and all that is hurting and all that is mismatched and all the threats to our sense of identity are done away with for I will be with you. You can depend upon me, he says. What does this mean for us? There isn't a single person in this room who is normal. We're all in some sense trapped. All of us are messed up and all of us have got identity issues. But for each and every one of us, we can encourage one another to lean into Jesus. The road will be hard and long and we will have setbacks along the way. 
And if there is anybody in this room, of which statistically that may well be, who's struggling with identity issues, I want to say exactly that to you. The road will be hard, there will be setbacks along the way, but battle on because Jesus is with you. And so is this church family. The struggles will one day end because he is making all things new. Oh, Don, I've got one more quote that I wanted to bring to you. The thing about somebody who's struggling with gender identities is that they understand that something is amiss. And some of us might be here, we might be more trapped than them. Because somebody who at least realises that something is amiss is in a wonderful position to be able to find the right answer. For anybody in here who don't, doesn't think they're amiss, doesn't think they need salvation and upholding every day, doesn't think that they're at the whim of strange desires, ambitions and confusions every day, then you're nuts because you are. Every single day. So if they feel that if they're broken and they have a need to be fixed, then they can turn to the Saviour and so can we. They may even feel like they're a woman trapped in a man's body or vice versa, but what they do is they go to the one who sets people free who forgives us of our sin, who comforts us in our hurt, and who changes our desires over time. So gender isn't something that we ignore or suppress or remove at all because it's God-given. Human wholeness comes not by denying reality, but by finding the comfort of the ultimate reality, Jesus Christ. When somebody who's struggling with transgender or gender identity issues um, tries to pursue a physical fix or change definitions and even society to conform to their sense of struggle, what we do is we invite them to be loving and say, I, with the strength and comfort that Jesus provides, I will think about how to love others rather than expect others to bend to me. And I think this is the trap that Jesus is trying to release these guys from here in Mark chapter 10. They are so caught up with their own confusion and their own hard-heartedness that they've missed the very, very one in front of them. And it's my hope and prayer that by just looking at this little example here, you and I sitting in this room, and I've made you think and work hard today, you and I sitting in this room will just be crying out to the Lord Jesus, rescue me from the expressions of hard-heartedness that are smashing me to pieces on a daily, a day-by-day -day basis and hurting those around me. Lord, help me to be strong in the identity that you've given me, that you've made me who I am, wherever and whatever that might look like, and you love me and will never leave and nor forsake me. Lord, help me to have a soft heart to you and offer that same grace and hope out to other people. Let me pray before we sing. Lord, we realise that by our own hard-heartedness, we've got so many things that are utterly bent out of shape about us. And Lord, it's strange because we didn't go looking for it. It just seems to have landed on us and we don't quite know how to cope with it. We're confused and also got lots of funny ambitions about how to get out of it, how to focus it and how to face it. Lord, please, would you let your wisdom and grace, the words of Jesus and his real presence by your spirit, break out amongst us so that we are the most unusual of people. Give us strength, Lord, we pray, at times when the enemy dares to suggest that you're not good, or at times when we have a tendency to believe that we know better than you. We pray, O oh Lord, we would have a hardened heart against all that is evil and bent out of shape. And we pray that we would have a soft heart to all that is true and beautiful. So please, Lord, let your rescue continue in our lives, renew us, restore us, and help us offer that out to needy people too. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.